Hello and welcome back to Eotas the Boxing Champion in the distance. Uh, well, yeah, he's going for the good punches. A uh, little, yeah, left hook right there. Just go, guys. What now? Oh, right hook, of course. Classic move. Anyway, uh, let's just go and meet him. Can I go there? Um, do I need to go back to the Grand Promenade? Hmm. Now maybe the previous place could be it. Uh, probably, pre probably the previous place. <clears throat> All right, Grand Promenade. And basically, the question is: of this whole thing, however, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But the basic question is like: how much is freedom worth? Like. Um, so now it comes to this, Aimika. Yeah, we got this uh, weird pirates who were just showed up as well. <clears throat> so how much is freedom worth? Like, the life with the gods is maybe not that bad, but Eatas seem to think that it's just uh, not ideal, and he's w he wants to change it, and he believes that humans can. Um, can fix the wheel, and the gods have no, 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 no authority to really rule over everybody. Anybody. <clears throat> okay, Captain Ferrante, what am I supposed to do with you? You think to steal my golden dream. But I will not allow it to happen. You stupid. My gratitude is yours for disabling the storms. It seems I did not require Rivan's ship to reach Yukaiso in the end. Rotai's commandeering this land, retreat or die. In that you are mistaken, Aimika. And not for any reason would I leave the lost city of gold unplundered. If you do not believe that, you have never met a true pirate. The lost city of gold will be the foundation of the future of the Principi. And you, you will die now for the greater good. Kore, Skazita. Give my regards to the gods. You suicidal something? I'm betting that these guys gonna die in, uh... Pretty fast. Seems like they might be a little bit strong. Okay, I, I don't wanna click a button though. I just gonna make it too easy. Whoa, who put that wall? It was not me because my wall is just stupidly powerful. Wait. Oh, they put that dumb wall. That that wall is extremely strong. Hey, watch it with that. Don't kill her there, okay? Who the hell? Spiritual allies dominated. Everybody just sh kill that. Is there a way to disable that dumbass wall? Okay, the wall is out. Finally. That wall is stupidly powerful. That's it. What dream? I met all the pirates. They're dead. I hear you. So where I'm going now? Oh, we can go down there. Okay. Right? Yeah, we can. The Moy Gwet. It would have been uh, preferable if you can pressure the gods to somehow give up the, their power, but apparently that's not an option. Or at least, uh, not an option you are, well, you can pursue. Okay. You descend into the ancient winding streets of Ukaizo. Battered by storms for thousands of years, the ruins bear the marks of their role as the lone witnesses of the gods' great secret at the center of the city. 
The houses and boulevards are pierced by great spears of luminous Audra. There are no ashen bodies, no birds, no sign or sound of any life. But with every step, the rhythmic pounding in the distance draws near. Soon, you can feel the vibration traveling up your spine. As you approach the center of the city, the weathered architecture gives way to more luminous Audra piercing the ruins, eventually overtaking them entirely. Cresting the top of a fallen tower, you finally get a clear view of Aethys. He stands, legs astride, next to a great stone monument ringed with eleven cavernous alcoves. All but three hold a gargantuan skeleton, bones scrubbed clean by the city's storms. An immense anguithin machine floats above the monument, suspended by invisible energy emanating from a well of light beneath it. Great brass rings spin around a core of metal and Audra at the machine's center. Periodically, Aethys's massive arms swing back. The movement alone is enough to draw great gusts of wind toward him. When they come down on the machine, the impacts are accompanied by eruptions of electricity, fire, and smoke. The hundreds of luminous Audra pillars across Ukaizo sympathetically dim in a rippling wave that spreads out from the machine. The only safe route to the god is a steep ascent along a monstrous pillar of luminous Audra, intertwined with fragments of Ukaizo's ruins that it has carried through the centuries. The pillar bends in a long arc, towering above the machine. The pillar levels out near Aethys's head, a silent observer to the destruction of the machine it has grown beside over thousands of years. You weave your way along a treacherous rain-slicked path up the pillar's skyward side. As you arrive at the top, you catch Aethys's attention. Fist pulled back, he pauses to observe you. With the same gentleness he showed at Ashen Ma, he lowers his arm and turns toward you. Bro, oh, we're gonna have a nice chat. Is it not gonna be a text, ad text adventure, so to speak? Strange to see you Kaizo in this way. <clears throat> hey, big guy. It may be hard to picture. But this city was once full of life. The Hawana, yes. But also kith from many other cultures. I suppose the gods kind of kicked them out. Great hanging trees shadowed these boulevards. Gardens sprawled across the open rooftops. Each spring, a festival procession would wind its way from the hillside into this valley. The celebrants would pass through a steep walk among the stalls of foreign merchants, flowers falling upon them from all sides. All people of all nations, together in a celebration of new life. Such was the power and beauty of Lost Ukaizo. If we don't fix this mess you're about to cause, the whole world is going to look this bad. I mean, it's a mighty heavy load you're putting on our shoulders. I just hope we can carry it. As long as there are people like you in this world, Adair, I truly do. This power has always been in the grasp of mortals. Now you will finally be aware of it. Now you will be able to decide what to do with it. Well, I have to say, mortals are kind of unreliable as well. Okay. Gone, please. I'm begging you. What do I do following this? How... How am I to best serve those still living? To improve our future chances of survival? As much as I... Uh, like picking his mind, he might be a little bit... Um, he's he's kind of partial to just punching that pillar. Or whatever that is. The dead fire and the eastern reach are full of animancers. Women and men with brilliant minds who can solve this great problem. Okay. 
They will also need people with brilliant souls, like you, Shodi. People who can tend to the spiritual needs of the world in a time of fear and desperation. Remember, the flame you bear is not only light, but warmth. Provide comfort to all who need it. The Navy thinks very highly of this place. Maybe I like their imagination. What do you think, big guy? Are all the hopes and dreams of Rawatai here on Ukaizo? Is this city really the cornerstone of our future? Ukaizo's time has passed, Maya. It remains only as a symbol. But symbols can hold great power. If you wonder about the future of Rawatai, know that if there is any greatness in your people, it existed before you set foot in this ancient place. Ukaizo will not make Rawatai any greater or lesser than it already is. Only its people possess that power. But what of you, Watcher? Why have you followed me? Have you come to bear witness to the breaking of the wheel? Yeah, but brought popcorn and everything. That's all I want to do. I've come to ask you to take pity on the mortals of this world who would suffer for your actions. After you've gone, the gods will go to war with each other and with mortals, unless they have a strong leader. Whoa, what? Mortals are going to need a head start on things to prevent the gods from re-establishing control. You need to inspire them. I want you to go further than breaking the wheel. I want you to destroy it all. No, 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 I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. I would prefer turning off the wheel. I come to fight League only to bear witness. Mortals are going to need a head start on things to prevent the gods from re-establishing control. You need to inspire them. Yeah. Mortals are already inspired. It is what has pushed them on for hundreds of generations to reach this point in time. Animancy is poised to go far beyond what we and Gwythans ever discovered. Mm. Why do you? Why does Helia think I should lend more power to mortals? If this is truly for the benefit of mortals, you are obligated to set them on the right path, not just leave them stranded. I want to ensure that the gods don't have the upper hand in the struggle to come. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't want... Like, what if it doesn't work? Don't leave... Don't leave us stranded, okay? I see your point. Perhaps it was naive of me to think that mortals could immediately set about to fixing the wheel in the midst of such chaos. From where should mortals draw their inspiration? This is a weird talk. <clears throat> they should look to the future. Their imagination and incentive spirit should guide them. It's okay. They should take lesson from the over's past. The rich history of their cultures. Well, you can argue for both, but I suppose looking to the future is preferable. Very well, Watcher. I will ensure that mortals are inspired by my passing. That my power not be expended in vain. I must attend to my final work now. I cannot delay any longer. You have carried a heavy burden across the dead fire, Watcher. Before I go, I would rid you of it. No sooner have Eltas's uh, words entered your mind than you hear one final dissonant ring of the chime within you, then silence. The knot that formed when the pallid knight first addressed you in the beyond is now gone. You are free now, as free as any of us can be. Many will come to you for help in the years ahead. Animancers, priests, even the gods themselves. I have great hope for you. But always remember that your future is for you to decide. Use your freedom well. Aethys squares himself to the machine. As you move to a safe distance, he draws his fist back and resumes his assault. The blows rain down with increased fervor. But the machine perseveres in spite of his efforts. Spreading his arms wide, 
Aethys draws power from the luminous Audra clustered around the valley. The energy courses through his body, limbs overflowing with intense light and waves of heat. Isn't there like an ostrich? There was the, you know, the storm machine, and I just turned it off, and you just tried to punch that thing. Seems like a lot of work. He returns to his task, each strike bringing with it the sound of cracking stone and twisting metal, the flickering of luminous Audra across Ukaizo. As the ancient machine finally begins to succumb to his strength, so too does Aethys's body, built to withstand the passage of thousands of years. The great Audra statue has finally been pushed beyond its limits. Cracks appear along the hands, then race up the arms. Aethys does not slow his assault, but continues unabated. Its brass rings twisted, the machine spins erratically but withstands the relentless barrage. Aethys stands astride it and pummels the base of the machine. Soul energy begins to flare out from the machine's heart, warping the air with the intense heat. Aethys drives his right fist into the machine's center, the core of metal and Audra. The god lets out a deafening shout, something between a cry of anguish and a roar of exultation. You see Aethys's arm shatter upward from his hand through his elbow. A flash of light and heat bursts from the core, accompanied by a cacophony of destruction. The moment passes as Aethys's shout echoes throughout the valley. Your eyes begin to recover. The god's work is accomplished. The great machine of Ukaizo has been destroyed. The wheel has been unmade. As Aethys's voice fades, the enormity of what you've accomplished sinks in. You have confronted a god. You have rediscovered the ancient city where the wheel was forged, and you have seen the wheel shattered. What comes next is uncertain, but already the legend spreads of the Watcher, who survived Andra's mortar and stood toe to toe with Aethys. So, I'm obviously conflicted about this uh, outcome. Of course, we don't exactly know the outcome uh, yet, and that's why I want to a little bit stop here to uh, explain my my thoughts a little bit. <laughs> Thing is, what the 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 damage Aethys uh, did. Like, killing a bunch of people was already done. So I was not really considering that. So, is it worth to destroy the wheel and possibly people can... Like, it's a maybe. It's a maybe that people... Uh, people fix it, I suppose. The natural will uh, resume. And uh, but also people won't be won't have to serve the gods anymore. And that's a that's a big plus, I suppose. As much as uh, people progressed, I I personally believe that of course the gods were responsible for many atrocities, some like helping people as well, but atrocities and ultimately, like they just had really no right, I suppose. And it's, it is preferable to not have them uh, ruling people. <sighs> I don't know. It, it, it's tough. The alternative is that we kill Eotas, stop this action, and everything returns to normal. The thing is, what happens in a thousand years, in two thousand years? Probably gonna, the gods are gonna hold back mankind more and more and more. And uh, taking them out will be on a continued, uh, well, 
concern how do you take them out or should you even like probably gonna probably gonna destroy humanity or just kill people to the point where they just really slow down progress because that that's how they live what if the what if humanity decided to break the wheel and not support the gods they won't like they wouldn't stand for that they didn't give a damn about Eotas killing people, but they definitely cared about Eotas trying to overthrow them. And only Eotas could uh, achieve that. But if people did it, like, they wouldn't even hesitate to kill everybody. So I suppose we can definitely consider uh, getting rid of the gods a plus. Just as a just gamble, like you basically like how much you're willing to uh, risk and sacrifice for your freedom. Well, it's a gamble. It's definitely a gamble. But let's just continue and uh, hear what happened. On your recommendation, Aethys disperses his essence and that of the thousands of souls within him to centers of knowledge and learning around the world. Animancers, engineers, wizards, and scholars of all stripes make astounding breakthroughs in understanding and harnessing the phenomena that govern Aeora. I suppose that was, uh, was, like, I don't really care about, um, uh, speeding up, uh, scientific breakthroughs that much. But I did care about making sure that people don't die, as Eotas had a fate in uh, that, that the Animancers are gonna figure out how to uh, re-establish the wheel. But I felt like, you know, you better make sure. This is not something you wanna uh, leave up to a maybe. While some of these developments prove beneficial to Kith, others are decidedly less so. But such is the price of innovation. What remains to be seen is how, indeed, whether they will restore the cycle Aethys has broken. Right, yes, that is uh, undoubtedly uh, the case. But I just wanted to give Kit the best chance to restore the cycle. And I, I assume that it's just gonna happen with science. As Rawatai's engineers had predicted, turning off the machine at Andra Spire calms not only the storms of Andra's mortar, but also those in Rawatai. For the first time, citizens of the mainland admire the beauty of sea and sky, without wondering when they will unleash destruction. The changes to Rawatai, however, extend far beyond the weather. Rawataians had long forged their identities around enduring hardship and laboring together. But over time, as their cities and crops flourish under sunny skies, they find they need one another less. Inevitably, some lament this softer, easier life. Others point to national self-reliance, to burgeoning industry, to families that did not have to send their kin abroad, as evidence that the new ways are vastly preferable to the old. Besides, Rawataians everywhere still share a purpose more urgent than any the world had ever known. Reforging the cycle of reincarnation. Yes. So, <clears throat> I felt like the Juana, as regrettable it is to put the Royal Deathfire Company, the Rawataians, uh, in charge, they were the only organized uh, force that actually wanted to do some good because the Wana leadership and the royals uh, did nothing they were not only ineffective but also extremely selfish I didn't even do a damn thing same goes for Principe and the Valian Trading Company basically there, is, there was no other faction I would say uh other than the Royal Deathfire Company. Maybe I don't didn't know too much about them, but they really seem like the the least bad option by far. 
The only other uh, faction I, I truly uh, cons uh, wanted to consider was the Juana. And I would have I would have loved to put them in charge somehow, but that would have required a queue, uh, most definitely. And I'm just I'm just a uh, well I guess a girl with a ship. I'm not really uh maybe I don't have the resources to really overtake the government. And I and I can't even offer a lot a lot to the people, so I don't know. Can I can I really do a better job? I don't I don't think so. Even if they accepted me, but that they probably wouldn't. So I did think that the Juana, like the Juana, were a good 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 bunch, but their leadership sucked. Uh, the Riotians were definitely a little bit aggressive. They they were. Uh, well, going away from Riotai because, uh, and they were expanding somewhat aggressively to other territories. And, uh, I suppose that is questionable. But I still felt like maybe they are the, the best option. Okay, despite, uh, their, well, their high emphasis on control, they seem to, uh, actually take care of the people, so... At that point, maybe they were the least bad. And I suppose this really helped the right eyes out. I would rather not say maybe, just hear what happened. The changes to Deadfire are just as significant. The Ranga Nui declares the archipelago an extension of his empire. And his administrators waste no time in making that true indeed. As well as in word. Not a huge fan of that. Also, this could have been a, a great opportunity to just have the Juana. Like, they got what they wanted. They got their home homeland back, in a way. They don't have to send people away. Their homeland is, is thriving. It's... it's it's a perfect place to live, but this was the time to to not take it away from the Juana. I wonder if there's a way to uh, lead the Juana and kill uh, Queen Wonkaza. Now that is the outcome I I probably would have preferred. Rawatai and gunships patrol Deadfire, hunting down pirates and smugglers, including the remaining Principi. After their defeat at Andra's Mortar, the pirate nation stands no chance against the organized might of Rawatai. I'm, I'm cool with that. As Rawatai and farmers, merchants, and laborers move to the archipelago, there is little room and less patience for the Valian Trading Company. The Ranga Nui soon forces the Valian Trading Company to surrender its holdings in Deadfire, straining relations with the Republics. Well, they they have questionable business practices. That's for sure. I do like giving, uh, like them freedom, I suppose, to do their thing, but... Forces the Valian the Trading Company to surrender its holdings in the Deathfire? That's pretty aggressive again. So maybe I should have went with the Juana. I know that the Deathfire uh, Trading Company can be... Royal Deathfire Company, the Royal Tians, can be quite aggressive. Okay. Rawatai knits its new archipelago together with all the tools of government and infrastructure. New ports spring up across Deadfire, guarded with sturdy Rawataian bronze and run with dispassionate Rawataian efficiency. Most Juana remain, even as their homeland changes around them. Or at least they are not kicked out.
The thing is, the Juana were in a position of... Well, they were very vulnerable. It was only a question of who's gonna overthrow them. Because the thing is, the Riotians moved in and they become a bigger power uh, than the Juana. The Juana had nothing. They were clinging to tradition, they were running around not even building walls, not caring about cannons, not caring about the damn thing. They were basically just running around with spears and, and maybe hoping for some water magic. That's it. That's, and that's not a lot. That's why I wanted to overthrow Queen Wankaza and do something. But damn. I suppose it's still not as bad as it could have happened. Their huts and lodges are cleared to make way for towns of stone and brick. The walls that are built to protect them also cut them off from the freedom of the open sea. Those Juana who trade caste and prize share for Rawatayan unity and striving prosper. Others mourn the passing of their queen and see the end of their way of life as a precursor of the doom of Aeora. Well, I think it's uh, the Juana's uh, system was a bit of a mixed bag. Like the the cast system was terrible. I didn't like that. Obviously, that's just a no go. The price share, uh, I think that's that that's pretty good, and uh, that could be pretty good. Especially for uh, smaller communities, making sure that everybody's taken care of. I'm fine with that, but the caste system is just a disgrace. So, I suppose it can be considered a. Uh, I don't know. Well, I suppose they lost their identity. I suppose we're not going to be too happy about these outcomes, necessarily. But I guess they are just fine, and they're not robbed. Only their identities change. And, uh, they are fine. Okay, continue. The mysterious deaths of Governor Clario and Storm Speaker Ikawa provoke hostilities between the Valian settlers and the Huawan residents. What starts with angry words escalates to retaliatory killings as each side blames the other. Who? Governor Clario and Storm Speaker Ikaha? This is at Port Maya, right? I had nothing to do with that. So... This probably happened after. Provoke hostilities between uh, the Valian settlers and the Juana residents. Great. Well, most most Valians are just just regular people. Want to have a decent life, I suppose. By the time anyone bothers to question the strange coincidences surrounding their deaths, including reports of a cloaked Omawi woman seen in both the port and the village. Both sides have gone too far to turn back. Maybe it was the Royal Deathfire Company. We do know that, that they like to do that. I don't know why I went with the Royal Deathfire Company. They put on now a good mask, but... God damn it. Should I went with the Juana? I think I should have went with the Juana. If, if not only Queen Wonkaza was so... So dislikable. The chaos makes it easy for a small Rawatayan contingent to swoop in and establish control over the island. Within days, they eject the remaining Valians and pacify the Juana. Port Marge becomes a valuable outpost, and one that allows Rawatai easy control over the southern end of Deadfire. It is, by all accounts, a smooth and exceedingly well-run operation. I have to say the the Royal Deathfire Company is efficient. 
I do prefer killing people in power rather than killing everybody if if that has to happen but but what I would question is the legitimacy of their actions and at this point it's uh, beyond questionable it's it's obviously wrong just killing uh on the governor and uh, the tribeswoman just to move in. As the balance of power changes in Deadfire, so too does Nekataka transform. While Hazanui Karu directs her fleet from Ukaizo, Atsura stays behind to manage Nekataka. Under his oversight, sturdy walls and artillery batteries rise to protect the city. Ships bearing settlers from Rawatai and staple goods from the archipelago churn the waters of Queen's birth. And despite the vacancies at Kahanga Palace, Atsura retains his simple quarters in the Brass Citadel. The Royal Deadfire Company evacuates and raises the gullet, hoping to lift the Raparu out of squalor and eradicate the criminal elements. They certainly rid Nekataka of an eyesore, though the larger problems of crime and poverty prove harder to solve. The loss of Skiarelifus's essence weakens the Water Shaper's guilt. Their power wanes and their influence fades. The art of water shaping survives as an arcane curiosity. Your brief encounter with Letharn proves deeply influential for the children of the Dawnstars. Plagued with nightmares and haunted by the deaths at Hesongo, Latharn begins questioning his faith in Aethys. At first, his fellow Dawnstars chide him. But that changes as word of Aethys' deeds at Ukaizo spreads. After all, what business have they worshipping a god who denied his own legitimacy? Well, de depends on your definition of the god. I guess Eotas was just a very powerful being who didn't want to be worshipped, he just wanted to help mankind. For the most part. Except for his uh, mad rush, desperate rush for uh, breaking the wheel. The faith of the children of the Dawn Stars fades, but their commitment to the people of Deadfire does not. They continue feeding, healing, and helping the neediest, just as they have for decades. It is no longer a holy mission, but it is a mission all the same. Sounds good to me. Ruanu, the chieftain of the Juana at Tikawara, dies mysteriously. <laughs> the tribe finds his body washed up on the same beach where Anaharu challenged him to the trial of waves. Some blame Anaharu's vengeful spirit. Others see it as Ngati's final judgment. And a few speak of a strange man seen lingering in the village god damn it the royal deathfire company with all the assassinations <sighs> i don't know why i trusted them I, I well i didn't i was i was forced into a choice it was a tough choice gotta be said i wonder what would have happened to the juana i suppose ultimately they, this was their I, I couldn't realistically go with the principi or the pirates well they're basically the same or the Royal Deathfire Company, like, I, 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 we cannot go with those guys. I think it was basically up to the Juana and the Royal Deathfire Company. And the Royal Deathfire Company was a lot more shady, but a lot more competent. And I'm just saying that's compared to the uh, completely incompetent. But also the, the Juana leadership was also pretty, pretty evil and incompetent. So, it was basically a choice between that. What do you want? Nothing or just competence? Well, at this point, but... Well, they were pretty shady about it. The, the assassinations. We did know about it uh, through Maya, I suppose. Uh, one. I know why I went with them. 
just the, the bloody Buonkaza. It was tough. I should have killed... I wonder if there's an, uh, an ending like that. That would be the best ending. But I kill Wonkaza, take her place. The, th the thing is, I, I gained so much influence for the Juana. I, I'm just, I was just surprised that it wasn't even a consideration at all. Like, I suppose it was, uh, well, that, that's not how you do it. But still, I, I, I would have liked to, to, to explore that option. Anyway. At Sora sends a ship with food, aid, and a small garrison of soldiers to the unfortunate village. The leaderless tribe is all too happy to accept Rawatai's generosity. They return the favor by reaching out to other far-flung tribes on behalf of their new benefactors. So, in a way, the Royal Death Fire Company is establishing uh, control and... Uh, well, it makes the region somewhat stable, but their their methods are definitely questionable. Even if uh, well, I think is people just gonna add one and one together. Ultimately, if this this is how they take over every settlement, then it's gonna be a big problem. Thing is, the alternative is that they join the Roy That Fire Company, but of course the. Or just the, the the government, but that probably wouldn't happen uh, because uh, the Juana are pretty proud, <laughs> and that's not never gonna happen. So this is the way to to unite them <laughs> to kill people, just uh, regardless of who they are. Ships continue to disappear at the southeastern fringe of the archipelago. And stories circulate of a colony of vampires and gulls preying on their crews. Southeastern? I couldn't go there for some reason. That was one island that we couldn't explore. And I was not sure how to go there. God damn it. That, that's one fancy guy sitting there. The Hazanui soon sends the Rukapa, who end the horrors of Splintered Reef. Hmm. Though your adventures alter the destiny of Aeora and the balance of power in Deadfire, they also leave a lasting mark on those who travel at your side. Your companions find themselves changed in ways both big and small. Really? Elot, Pelagina, and Tehehu didn't even see much action. In the days sailing back from Ukaizo, Adair finds himself disillusioned with all gods, his own above all. Where the gods have touched dead fire, he sees only destruction, loss, and emptiness. He casts off all symbols of Aethys, and even begins refusing to use his name. Ultimately, he chooses to remain with you on the Defiant, <laughs> knowing if any mortal is to have the final word in a conflict with the gods, it will be the Watcher of Cadnua. We are no longer staying on the Defiant. We are staying on the uh, submarine that's called Sakateotis. Come on there. Shodi is not a priestess who understands the meaning of subtlety. As such, she makes her girlish crush on Adair painfully obvious from the moment she first sets eyes on the strapping fighter. Early in your travels, Adair appears discomforted by her persistent flirting. He often grimaces when she sidles up to him, and he takes endless pains to keep their conversations terse and to the point. But after a little smoothing on your part to nudge them in the right direction, Adair makes an effort to view Shodi with an open mind, and Shodi begins teasing the veteran fighter in a more companionable and less amorous manner. After saving each other's hides a couple times, and sharing more than a few laughs, the two form an easy, and you suspect, lifelong friendship. Yeah, that's fair enough. Seemingly lit with an inner glow, Shodi takes to a new life of mission work with Gusto. 
She still is committed to shepherding souls for Gon, but having realigned her goals with that of her fellow Dawn Stars, she now endeavors to help the living as much as the dead. As you travel the dead fire, you find her sleeping better and laughing more often. When the time comes for her to return to her temple in Nekataka, it's with a clear wistfulness and much lip biting on her part. She leaves you with her sickle and a hastily scrawled note. It reads, A keepsake from a path once walked. Remember me, Watcher, for I will forever dream of you. Why did you have to make it creepy? Why can't you just say, I remember you? Aloth renews his commitment to destroying the Leaden Key. With the wheel broken, loosening the god's stranglehold on Kith is more urgent than ever. It is a lofty goal, and one he does not expect to finish in his lifetime. But if there's one thing he's learned from the Watcher, it's that a single person can change the world. So, from what we've seen, Ender had, like, like mediocre to, I don't know, had, had a, a reasonable impact uh, and, and interaction with the story elements. And uh, Soti actually probably had the most. Maya actually had uh, quite a bit as well. Seraph had uh, the least, I suppose. Yeah. But it wouldn't be nice to bring a lot along. I kind of messed it up by picking a wizard, then actually making a lot another full wizard uh, with the initial choice. So I had the choice of going two full wizards, um, which was not ideal. So a lot. I do hope to take you on a ride. Some other time. Because I suspect uh, what he has to offer is quite interesting as well. Uh, by the way, I only consider the full characters, not only hirelings. Those are basically adventurers uh, that don't talk. Hirelings that we picked up and I don't really know the name of them. Like that... Uh, Pale elf like me. She seemed pretty interesting, but apparently she's only hireling. Uh, let's just go on. You let Romaro go, and the former pirate ostensibly set sail for the trade lanes of the Eastern Reach, the Edier Empire, Old Valia, and the Republics. For the remainder of your time together, Seraphin seems, if not exactly happy, at least contented with the outcome of your confrontation with his former mentor at Sayuka. And yet, when the two of you part, Seraphin seems emboldened, invigorated by a new sense of purpose. He buys you a drink, toasts to the dead fire, says, let's see if we can make something worth a shit out of what's left of these Principe swaps, and sets sail the next morning. In the years to follow, rumors occasionally reach you of the Blue Orland Pirate of the Dead Fire, a privateer captain as keen to free slaves or fight foreign influence as he is to plunder and pillage. Come on, you can't do that with the right eyes around. Time away from the Navy gives Maya Rua some perspective on how Rawatai conducted the Dead Fire occupation. No sooner does she return to active duty then she voices her frustrations over some of the more underhanded tactics she witnessed and carried out in the name of the homeland. Her voice carries all the way to the Ranganui, who reminds his admirals that battles are won by superior tactics, but war is a battle of precedent, and winning is not always a victory. The people listen. Really? Though Mayo's covert assignment in the Dead Fire is considered a success, few claim knowledge of it or openly congratulate her. She receives no praise beyond knowing glances or the occasional raised tankard from her countrymen. She never responds, 
Maya's part in the conquest of Ukaizo brings fame and fortune to the Rua family. Officers salute her in passing, and a row of medals decorate the breast of her uniform. Her parents and siblings are paraded between the great houses of Rawatai for nightly dinners and celebrations. She has a hero's welcome in her future. There's never enough free time to explore your mutual connection. Something about your bond feels unfinished. But as your paths diverge, you start running out of reasons to see each other. In your presence, she's always armed with a pleasant smile and lots of questions. Her embrace is full of warmth. If there isn't time now, someday there might be. Is that so? She looks forward to seeing her brother again. So does Ashiza. Takehu distances himself from the problems of the dead fire, giving the tribes a reprieve from godlike omens. And Gati's silence speaks volumes. The Juana grow to rely on each other, paving a new way forward divorced from their traditions. Soon after he departs Nekataka, distant tribes report of unusual and salacious water sculptures appearing on the shores. These quaint visitations are widely celebrated. The identity of the artist, ever an open question. Your farewell is short and cordial. Nothing further needs to be said, and you wish each other well. Takehu does not look back. The sea feels restless in his absence. You already left me, but I was uh, murdering the uh, the royal palace. Everyone in the royal palace. So Takehu, um, farewell, uh, blue boy. Your pursuit of Aethys and your journey to Ukaizo signal the end of forces that have shaped the lives of kith and the course of nations the cycle of reincarnation has been broken the storms of andra's mortar have calmed yet each ending promises a new beginning as the sun rises over ukaizo kith turn their gaze eastward wondering at what lies beyond and at the world they will fashion for themselves as the Watcher of Kadnua and the former Herald of Bereth, you return to your ship and begin the long journey home. You hope for calm weather. Seems like the last line. Yep, looks like it. Game is finished. Oh boy. That was a good run. I don't feel terribly uh, good about uh, choosing the Royal Death Fire Company, but I suppose I tried my best, and it was a good ride. So that's it, guys. Uh, thanks for watching, and uh, I have a good one. See you around.